Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. I'm sure many Christians, many our, our Catholics are puzzled when they hear the gospel for today, and the question would be, does Jesus teach hate? But just that you see the theme of this teaching of today, where do I always put Christ first, above all things and above all others? Is there such place? If it's like this, say thank you. If not, you need some kind of correction, as majority of us need correction. There are certain sayings in the Gospel of Luke which are particularly tough and difficult. And this might be the most scandalous or shocking of all Jesus' teaching of today's Gospel. Most people fail to understand or to accept this teaching. It's important teaching and that's why it's presented on one on the Sundays. The idea of hatred, hate crimes, is widely held up as one of the worst things a person can do. And really it is very evil, very sinful if somebody hates someone else. But be aware of the people who point to haters. I can prove you that these people are the most dangerous. The very first national system, French Revolution. Freedom, equality and fraternity. How long did they last? Ten years. How many victims? In ten years they have more innocent victims than 300 years of inquisition in the church. That's how system is, socialism without God or against God directly. Be aware of it. It's shocking to see this word, this kind of statement on the lips of Jesus. It's his demand to hate your father, mother, siblings, even your own life. What does he mean? That there's some kind of message there. It seems this is one of Jesus' hardest sayings. Oh, there's one exception. Well, unless you are a teenager. Uh, actually, if you are a teenager, you might think this one of Jesus saying is one of the easiest. Uh, you might remember your own age or just try to observe what is happening in this difficult transition of age. Make the checklist. So, yes or no? The first question is, can't stand my mind in that. Yes. Yeah? The second question, can't stand my brothers and sisters. Yes. Hate my life. Yes. The easiest saying of Jesus. But you will grow up. <laughs> and then what? Maybe if you are a teenager, this is one uh, is very easy, but not for everybody else. So you have to embrace it. You have to understand it first. Jesus is laying these conditions for being one of his disciples and the costs of discipleship. The word disciple uh, there in the Bible, the Greek word is matetes. So literally means a student. This is the ancient way of teaching that uh, any craftsman, any teacher of philosophy has a student. They were imitating their teacher and eventually becoming like their teacher, sometimes surpassing the teacher. So if you want to be a student of Jesus, you have to hate your mother, father, sister, brother, wife, children, and even your own life. That's what Jesus said. Otherwise, you can't be his student, his follower. It's a very hard saying, so a very justified question. Does the Greek word hate mean something different? Let us go to the source of the language. In its original context, the Greek word hate, miseo, is exactly what it means in English, hate. So, which would mean to will evil to another. That's a very devilish, to wish evil to other people. Run away on this attitude and pray for this goodness of heart to wish well, not only to your friends and family, but even to the people who do not like you. Wishing well is the answer. So how can Jesus tell his disciples to love their enemies in chapter 6 and then to hate their family in chapter 14 in the same gospel, full of Luke? And this should be immediately the hint because you have to take the whole teaching of Jesus. If you love those who love you, Jesus said, what credit is that to you? So he was extending, you don't love just your family, your friends, your benefactors, you show well-wishing to everywhere. 
And he said very clearly, but love your enemies, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. So what kind of puzzle is this? It would be a contradiction for Jesus to say, love your enemies, but hate your family. Just see the paradox in the teaching of Jesus. One of Jesus' favorite methods of teaching is what scholars call hyperbole, which would be to exaggerate something. And the shock value helps people remember it, and then they repeat it to others. You know, like funny joke, or here applying to the gospel. Have you heard? He said to hate your father and mother? How he could ever say something like this? And then people are digging, try to understand in the context. So Jesus' most famous example of hyperbole is from Mark 9. We hear it every Lent season. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And we know from the very beginning of Christianity, there was not even any mistake that people would cut their hands or pluck out eyes. Everybody knows it's hyperbolic, so it means if breaking with the sin is painful as cutting your hand, if it's as painful as plugging your, out, uh, your eye, you should do it, break with the sin, because you just lose a bit of your body, but you save your eternal life, your soul. So it's very typical teaching of Jesus, and just be aware, apply to today teaching. Jesus is using hate as a hyperbole in order to emphasize that you can prefer no one else to him. And that's what it really means in his teaching. So how do I know that that's what Jesus means by hate? You go to the scripture. There are examples in the Old Testament in which the word hate clearly means a preferential love. I'll just give you one example. You can search for others. There are many of them. In Genesis chapter 29, the very first book in the Bible, there is a famous story of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. Remember, Jacob cheated his father. He had to run away for his life, he went to his uncle, and then he fell in love with Rachel. But on the day of wedding, Jacob gets tricked into marrying Leah, the oldest daughter, before Rachel, who he was in love with, who he worked seven years for. Now, just see what is coming around. He just tricked his father, and he was tricked in a very similar way. So Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban uh, for another seven years to get Rachel. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, as exact translation, he opened her womb. What does it mean? He gave her children. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture, there are the same words for love and hate that Jesus uses here. Miseo for hate and agapao for love. So we have very continual, the same understanding of this word. In context, it's clear that Jacob doesn't harbor ill will, nor is he trying to harm Leah. The proof? They had seven children, six boys and one girl. So what kind of hate was this? But Jacob preferred Rachel to Leah, so God blessed Leah with children because she was hated that she would be loved more in her children. Kind of balance, God's balance. That's the meaning of Jesus' words when he says, unless you hate your father and mother, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you put me first, preferential love, you fail. So if you still have any doubts, you can always search in a different version of the gospel. You don't even need to go to Greek translation, you have just compared, you can find references, especially in the Gospels, to another Gospel, so it's easy to find. Look in Matthew uh, chapter 10. Jesus said a different way, the same message. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So if you put these two texts together, the message is absolutely clear. The meaning is very clear. You can't love any member of your family, no matter who they are, more than you love him. 
Have you ever wondered why Jesus is so jealous or so self-obsessed? Oh, it came from my mind when I was much younger. Have you noticed that Jesus is teaching about two commandments and he is making this statement, the first and the second commandment. Why? The first is to love God and the second is to love the neighbor. The second is rooted in the first. If you don't have love of God, whatever you call this your love is not rooted in God. It's not true sacrificial love. That's why if you don't put him first, you cannot really truly love your family. I gave you this example a few weeks ago with St. Faustina, amazing dedication to the mystery of the Eucharist, a vision of the ciborium, this vessel when you keep the Holy Communion. And Jesus told her, take this vessel of Holy Communion, take me to the tabernacle. And she was doing so devoutly and lovingly. And when she returned to cell, he challenged her, I want you to serve your sister's nuns with the same love as you have taken me to the tabernacle. If you don't have love of Jesus, you cannot really have love to other people. Don't be too literalistic when it comes to the, an example of hyperbole. If you take another eye for eye and tooth for tooth, if this would be applied, the world would be blind and toothless. So see what is happening with wrong understanding or wrong application. Jesus is emphasizing conditions and costs of discipleship. They are costs. The self, the ego, has to die. And that's why it's so difficult. This doesn't necessarily lower the shock value of what Jesus would be saying to his initial Jewish audience. You have to love me more than any other human being, including your wife, your husband, children, or your parents. Who would have the right to demand that you love them more than your parents, the one who gave you life and everything you needed? The second tablet of Ten Commandments starts with honor thy father and thy mother. As the fourth commandment, it literally means to glorify your mother and your father. Be grateful for bringing you to this world and be grateful for all the sacrifices which they did to raise you up. So, who demands that kind of exclusive, absolute, and supreme love? Every Jewish person knew it. This was their daily prayer. It's the Lord. In Deuteronomy, the book of Moses, in chapter 6, you have, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. They knew it. They prayed it every day. So the connection was absolutely shocking. Jesus doesn't go around the streets and saying, hey everybody, I'm God. But he says it implicitly. The only reasonable explanation for how Jesus could ask for such love is that he isn't just the Messiah or just the King of Israel or just a prophet. He's the one true God of Israel. And that's what was the shocking element in his statement. Implicitly, he declared I'm God, I'm divine. That's why Jesus can demand the absolute and exclusive love. The more you are rooted in love of Jesus, the more you are dedicated to the people. This very difficult passage is actually one of the key texts in the Gospel. Jesus is making demands that only God himself could make of an Israel audience this demand. Only. And they understood and the challenge was thrown on people and leadership. So if Jesus would just stop with saying you have to hate, it would be more difficult to understand. But fortunately, he continued so, giving us more insight. Whoever does not bury his own cross and come after me can't be my disciple. So what does Jesus mean when he says hate your own life? He doesn't say hate the good things which are in you. Hate the things which do not belong to God, which are not out of God. This is what we should reject. This is what we should renounce. For the good things, we should bless the God and be grateful. It's so easy for us to spiritualize this saying of Jesus. Oh, just take your cross, your sacrifice, your chores, your obligations, and so on. Put yourself in the timeline when Jesus was saying this word. 
In its original context, the cross wasn't yet a metaphor for suffering, for making sacrifice. The cross was a Roman method of execution that was widely known as the most brutal, shameful, painful, and most disgraceful way to die. And this is what Jesus was saying to them. They knew it was not a symbol. It was real life. If you are not willing to go to the guillotine or the electric chair or the gibbet of the cross, then you can't be my disciple. And people were still listening to him, even if he was challenging us so badly. Disciples are to lovingly and generously accept the suffering that comes their way as a part of being united to Christ crucified, to reflect in our lives the mystery of the life of Jesus, as he was doing this with Israel, reliving the history of Israel. That's completely legitimate interpretation of Jesus' words, but see how Jesus is rewarding if you make this growth, if you make this decision to give up everything for God's love. I'm returning to the French Revolution. These 16 brave Carmelite sisters who offered their life for the freedom of the church and restored God's order, and they were guillotined, all of them, martyrs. You can pray for their intercession, especially in our time. And just one sacrifice, 16 brave women, they finished the French Revolution. This was the last innocent execution. Sorry, last one. one. The last was not innocent. Robespierre, the leader of this French Revolution, was on the same guillotine, killed, decapitated. See the reward and see the power of offering their life in union with the crucified Jesus. So Jesus is a rabbi at the church and he's laying these shocking demands, conditions and costs of discipleship. What it means to be a follower of him. You have died to yourself, to any evil which is not part of God. So notice when does Jesus do this. He has all these crowds of people. Jesus is getting really popular. He could like fly on this good reputation. And he says, do you really want to be my disciple? Let me tell you, it's going to cost you everything. If you like or not, we leave everything in this world when we are called to the other world. But don't be terrified because you know how to do it. And many of you did at least once in your life. When you are standing in front of the altar and the other person, your spouse, was asking of you everything and you didn't see it as a burden, you didn't see it as a persecution, it was privilege. So you would trust the other human being who will obviously disappoint you or harm you, even if it's involuntarily, and you will not trust God? Where is the blockage? So that's what the two final analogies, parables, are supposed to explain. Building a tower and going to war. Look, nobody is going to start building a tower without first sitting down and counting the cost. The people are quite good in calculating. You don't really see an empty slab around and they didn't continue building of the house or any factory. It's very seldom some abandoned things, yeah, that there are somehow some ruins, but not as somebody starting. So we are quite good in calculating. Just like you count the cost before you build a tower house, so count the cost before starting to follow me. That's what Jesus is saying. It will cost you, but not the real things but this which shouldn't be in our life. So, same thing, what king is going to go to war without taking out his map, looking at the number of his soldiers, supplies, etc., and then say, asking, can I actually win this war? If not, we'd better do some negotiating. Here's the nimshal, as Dr. Peter is saying, the upshot of these parables. Whoever of you doesn't renounce all that he has can't be my disciple. If you don't rely on Jesus, if you don't renounce the things which do not belong to Jesus, you are just pretending you are his follower. The word apotasso, which means to give up or to renounce all that he has. And this is very important 
understanding that, that the tradition of the church has not interpreted it in the absolute way. The tradition by capital T is this what everywhere, all the time, and uninterruptedly was believed. This what is some kind of security, is a correct understanding. And this saying of Jesus was never applied to all people equally. In a broader context, it is demand of every person that we love Jesus more than any person. No exception or any material thing. So that's quite obvious. But see how does the catechism interpret this verse? Because this is quite solid teaching of the church that you understand. It's quotation from there. Jesus enjoys his disciples to prefer him to everything and everyone and bids them renounce all that they have for his sake and that of the gospel, quoting Luke gospel. So shortly before his passion, Jesus gave them the, the example of the poor widow of Jerusalem who out of her poverty gave all she had to live on. She offered everything to the treasury in the temple in Jerusalem. The precepts of detachment from riches is obligatory for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Are you free? Are you detached? Who has the TV? You have TV or TV has you? Who has the computer? Who has the cell phone? You have the cell phone or cell phone has you? Detachment. The Catechism of the Catholic Church does not say that every single person has to become a monk or a nun and live the life of radical poverty. It was never interpreted like this. The majority of Christians live in a married state and they express their life detachment from riches through almsgiving. Mainly it's through giving alms to the poor and the church. The poor mouths you have at home the little people who need to be clothed are at home. Love always starts at home. And, if possible, extending outside. I'm not banging the drum of almsgiving. Jesus is banging the drum. It's his teaching. He's repeating again and again. And the poor widow is so detached from her possessions that even her last two pennies she gave them to God. Would you? It was always challenging me from my teenager's years. Would you offer everything to God? Obviously, she was trusting that God will provide for her and he will care for her. And surely he did. However, some people are called to live out Jesus' demand of discipleship in a radical, total and complete way. And the Catechist recognizes that as well. It's not a huge number of the people, but they are present even in our world. From the very beginning of the church, there have been men and women who have renounce the great good of marriage to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And Christ himself has invited certain persons to follow him in his way of life, of which he remains the model. Second century, there was this big movement of monks and nuns who were going to the deserted place and devoted themselves completely to the life of prayer and penance to help people to turn to God. So the Catechist is saying that everyone is called to put Christ first. There's no really exception from this. But for some people, that means following Jesus in a life of evangelical counsels, of poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's why the religious life is so important. And those who are called, they should respond to it. And one of the signs when you, it's very repeated that it's disappearing from our society, you, you don't see really monks or nuns on the streets. This was constant reminder I see with myself, when I'm walking with the color, how do we behave? People are watching. Maybe you are reminding someone you are not living for this earth only. We do have people who, in a sense, take Jesus literally. So they renounce everything to go and follow him and live that life that he lived, completely and totally devoted to the mission of bringing the gospel to the world. If you have someone from your family, just be grateful and support them. So to conclude today's teaching, you have to look at the whole teaching of Jesus in the light of the resurrection, in the light of the whole teaching of Jesus. We are all called on some level to ask ourselves, how can I live out the same spirit of renunciation in my own life? 
Remember, this is a very common confusion. You renounce the things which shouldn't be in your life, not the good things which are good for the family and which are glorifying God. The Holy Spirit gives us that wisdom to see things in an eternal perspective. Call on the Holy Spirit to see through the lenses of God. And if you truly loved your family, then you would put Jesus first and then he brings it all along together. In this life, and I hope you want to have your family on the other side. So this is what guarantees putting Jesus first that he will take us all the heavenly realms. That's really what the whole gospel is about. Putting first things first. You do it, everything falls in the right place and brings glory to God and our eternal salvation.